Okay, we're waiting for the for people to come on uh, online. So we're waiting about 30 seconds or so. All right, so welcome to the second lecture of the module on education. Today I'm going to talk about some hypothesized barriers to the achievement of schooling attainment, which is, of course, one input into education. And the three that I'm going to look at are health, that some people have hypothesized, many people have hypothesized that uh, low levels of health impede learning. Uh, and we're going to see this uh, attempts to alleviate the, this health barrier, uh, in particular, looking at uh, a Kenya deworming randomized controlled trial, and then looking at Bangladesh, where there was a, a, a major clean water initiative. The second one will be the, the notion that large families are a burden on achieving schooling attainment, which has led to uh, countries invoking population control policies. And we'll look particularly at the, the China's one-child policy to evaluate uh, the degree to which this is a, a major burden. And then third, at the end, we'll look at the notion that it's high opportunity cost of schooling, particularly for low-income families and where the, the income contributed by children play a major role. And we'll look at the Mexican progressive program, which was designed to directly reduce those uh, opportunity costs. All right, so let's start with, with health. Uh, poor health is clearly, as we showed yesterday, a feature of low-income countries and is thought to be one of the reasons for a lack of uh, growth in those countries. Now, of course, as I mentioned briefly, in steady-state economic growth models, there's actually no role for, for growth. Growth can only increase the level of income. It has no effect on the growth rate. But one connection between health and the growth rate would be specifically through augmenting uh, schooling. And we looked at the mechanisms by which schooling could affect the growth rate through adoption of technology, et cetera. And it's, it's, it seems reasonable that poor health among children uh, could reduce their attendance in school or conditional on their attendance, their performance in school. And indeed, if you look at Africa, for example, where worm, worms are a major health problem, uh, they mostly affect uh, children, 85 to 90 percent of, uh, of infections, for example, in eastern Kenya are associated with, with children. And a remedy exists that deworming of, of individuals is relatively cheap. It just requires a, a single dose for a year of a pill, which is, reduces the infections by 99 percent. Um, and, and so it, it's a reasonable question to ask if we were to deworm the population, what would have, what, how would that affect uh, schooling? And in fact, we see an important study uh, that, that does that. But it, the one we're going to look at is not the first to do it. There's been lots of randomized controlled trials using deworming pills. It's a very simple um, medical type intervention. But they have actually a major flaw because most of the randomization of, of the treatment of children occurs within schools where both the control and the treatment group are within the same classes within the school. And the problem with this are, are pretty, you would think pretty obvious. The first is that given that these are infections, uh, there's externalities, and therefore the control group is going to be affected by the treatment group. To the extent that there are less infected people in the group, uh, that will affect the ones who are not, not treated. This is something now we're much more familiar with when we look at the impact of, of COVID. But the second is as well, if that we're evaluating the impact of the, of the treatment, we need to take into account that a, a treated individual doesn't just reduce uh, or reduce the infection for that individual, it reduces the infection of others. And that's part of the return to the, to the treatment. So the Miguel and Kramer study is going to remedy that because its methodology is to randomize not within schools, but to, but to do it across schools. And in addition, it's going to use a technique to identify the externality uh, 
benefits from the, the interventions. And then there's also some long-term follow-ups to that, to that study. Okay. So the basic estimation strategy that's novel here is it's gonna take advantage of the fact that children in a particular neighborhood uh, may have gone to different schools. So there's going to be across neighborhoods, different densities of treated and untreated children. And so a particular child may be treated or not, but may be in an environment in which there is a different fraction of other treated children. And so by looking at the distances of uh, treated and non-treated schools, in addition to the treatment effect on an individual as seen in this specification, they're able to actually compute and estimate the, the externalities from the, from the treatment. So the average treatment effect is gonna be the treatment on the individual plus the sum of the externalities associated with the fact that there are gonna be less people infected due to that person being, uh, being treated. And when we look at the, the results, the, you know, they do find what's reasonable. There's a direct treatment effect. The dependent variable here is attendance in school. So what it says is that a child that is um, dewormed is going to have a 6% higher probability of attending school. Okay. But that child's a, a probability of attending school is also affected by the fraction of pupils in it, the, the child's neighborhood who were in treated schools. And it's that child's attendance in school is also gonna be affected by the fraction of children in its neighborhood who were in untreated schools and, and therefore are more infectious. And you can see that as a negative effect. So it, it was highly successful in differentiating between the externalities and the direct treatment effects. Now for our purposes, which is gonna lead us up to the issue of gender differentials, a finding that is actually neglected in the article, but is apparent in the, the tables that they present, which the authors in subsequent work when they did follow-ups then took into account is the following. What they found is when they computed the average treatment effects by gender, as you can see here, the, the effects of the intervention on the girls, on females was significant, but the effects on males was insignificant. If we look at the point estimates for the first treatment, they did it across different years, the effect on the women was uh, more than 50% higher. And for the, in the second year, the treatment effect was double uh, the effect on attendance compared to, compared to males. So this leads us into the puzzle of why we would expect to get this. And I'm gonna show you that this, is, this, this result is perfectly explicable and is going to tell us a lot about our understanding of why we also see in general that the schooling of women is higher than that of men. Okay. So that leads to the issue of gender and human capital. So there's three regularities that we need to explain. The first is, as we saw in this randomized controlled trial in Busia, Kenya, and, but is true for all studies of early nutritional interventions is that they all find that that increases the schooling of girls and not that of boys. So this is, this is something that's a regularity in the data. So whether the treatment is iodine or iron or, or other kinds of treatments, this is what you find in the long run. The second is what we saw yesterday, which is that over time, there's been a rise in schooling attainment of women relative to men. So that basically now in almost all countries of the world, the schooling of women exceeds that of men. So it's true in the US, it's true in Bangladesh, it's true in China. And we saw there's a couple of exceptions, but they are now really exceptions. And by understanding why in general, it makes sense why women have more schooling than men, then it tells us that, that there's something that needs to be investigated in environments where this is not true. And the third regularity is that in most countries of the world, the rates of return to schooling is estimated from those Mincer equations that we talked about are higher for women than men. So we'd like some framework that enables us to understand why all three of these things are, are true. What, what explains this? Okay. So first, look, just some description. Here is what's gone on in, uh, in China from the, the 2005 Chinese mini census. We see for urban areas, blue is, is men, uh, 
red is women. This is uh, mean years of schooling attainment. And we can see that by the 21st century, women have higher schooling attainment than, than men in male bias China. Even in rural areas, we see the same phenomenon of a, of a more rapid rise for, for women. It hasn't quite caught up yet, but I'm sure by now it, it has. Okay. Now, and also over time, the rate of return to schooling has risen in China and it's risen more for women. And of course it's higher for women than it is for men. Okay. So that's a sort of dynamic look at uh, what's going on in an, an economy that, that has experienced a lot of growth. We're gonna focus on Bangladesh. Okay. So let's look over time at what's occurred there. So the continuous line there is depicts the ratio of girl to boy enrollment in secondary schools. And what you can see is by the time we get to the 21st century, the secondary school enrollment of girls is now exceeding the secondary enrollment of, of boys. Okay. So what are these other lines in the graph? So the top line is, uh, represents the real wages in rural areas of Bangladesh. And you can see that it's been pretty stagnant. So we can't explain this rise in the relative school enrollment rates of girls by income growth. Okay. The bottom line depicts the fraction of the rural population that um, are members of microcredit associations. And you can see that's increased over time. And we associate Bangladesh with microcredit, of course, and there has been a significant increase in that, in that fraction over time. But you can see that the big uptick in that occurred significant, substantially later than the uptick in the enrollment rate. So probably that doesn't have much to do with the rise in enrollment. The middle line, however, shows us the fraction of the rural population with improved sanitation. There was a massive public investment in changing the sources of water in rural areas from ground, from surface water, from rainfall sitting in stagnant pools to using wells. And we see that casually. There is an association between what happened with respect to improvements in sanitation and what happened to secondary school enrollment. Is there any reason to believe that these two things are connected? Well, that's what we'll look at here. And just to show you that this campaign of improving sanitation had an effect on nutritional status and schooling, or not necessarily effect on schooling, but what happened over time, this just repeats what you basically see. If we look in 81 at the enrollment rates by age in school, by boys and girls, we can see in 81, it was higher for boys at almost every age. And when we get to 2002, 20 years later, it's higher for girls at every age. So there's been a real change, both an increase in schooling and this flip around of uh, who's getting more schooling by gender. There was real nutritional gains. BMI went up in those 20 years for both men and women. And there was an increase in stature in height as well for both men and women, but men are taller than women. All right, now what there wasn't really a change in is occupational structure. So there was no real structural change. If you look in rural areas and, and the data that we're gonna look at intensively is from rural areas, so we'll concentrate on that. You can see that you know, a vast majority of workers are working in manual labor jobs. Okay, the, the, the number of skill jobs in the economy is, is quite low in, in, in rural areas. And that's gonna be important to us. Again, in yesterday's lecture, I emphasized that the productivity of schooling is heavily defend, dependent on what people do in the economy as well as technical change, okay? The female occupational distribution, first of all, most women are not working in rural areas in the, in the labor, formal labor market, okay? But when they do, it's quite different, the distribution. Um, compare it to men, and we'll, we'll talk about it more intensively. Now, it's not that men don't use their heads. They do, okay, but it's, it's manual labor. All right, so we're gonna explore that all of these three phenomena, the, the higher levels of schooling by women, the fact that the rate of return to schooling looks like it's higher for women, and the fact that nutritional investments tend to increase schooling for women and not so much for men can be explained by the comparative advantage of women in skill versus brawn. Brawn is just a medical word for, for strength. 
And the framework we're going to look at incorporates both occupational sorting according to this comparative advantage, as well as endogenous investments by households in both schooling and nutrition. And we're going to look at unique data from Bangladesh, as well as data from rural urban China to, to test these ideas. Okay? The data from Bangladesh cover 25 years, a panel of, of individuals over, over 25 years, which has information on person-specific food consumption. The data from China is special because it's data that's going to describe a child and adult twins, which we'll exploit. So the framework that I'm going to, to talk about incorporates the role of brawn as well as schooling. So oftentimes in the models that you see, it's all about schooling investment, right? And no attention at all to nutritional status and, and strength. So it's going to incorporate heterogeneity in brawn, in strength. It's going to look at nutritional investments as well as schooling investments. And it's going to look at occupational choice. And the model will embed within it a labor market which has the basic features of the, the Roy model. The Roy model features are that workers are bundles of productive attributes and the attributes that we'll highlight are skill and brawn, strength. Workers are gonna choose those activities based on comparative advantage with respect to those attributes. And the attributes themselves will be rewarded differently in occupations, which, which makes a lot of sense. So for example, in the occupation we're all in or plan to be in, the returns to strength are minimal. Returns to skill, very high. On the other hand, if we were a uh, harvester, the returns to skill, as we saw, would be very low, and the returns to strength would be very high. And people are going to choose occupations depending on their relative uh, comparative advantage in those two attributes. Okay? And of course, the attributes are, in part, in optimally chosen. They're endogenous. Okay, so if we're going to talk about gender differences, we have to have fundamental differences by, by gender that are not culturally bound, that are not choices. Okay? And the two that we highlight, which, for which there is strong medical evidence uh, that, are, that is not controversial at all, and I'll, I'll show you, and we're going to find, the, we're going to replicate that evidence in, in these data. The first is that men have substantially more brawn than women. So men have an absolute and a comparative advantage in brawn compared to women. Flip that around, that means that women have a comparative advantage in skill compared to men. And let me show you that, that this is not a trivial difference. So, and it's also not cultural and, and has nothing to do with what environment people are in. The top graph is a distribution of the outcomes of a grip strength test applied to adults, males and females in the United States. Okay. And what you can see is the, the continuous line is the distribution for men and the discontinuous line is the distribution for women. That's a considerable difference, okay? The bottom graph is the same exact grip strength test applied to a population of adults in Bangladesh, in rural Bangladesh. And you can see that the results are almost exactly the same. So it has nothing to do with the occupations people are in, their level of schooling, the, the, the religion or anything else. And what these data say is that 40% of the men are stronger than the very strongest women in the, in the, in the complete distribution of women, right? So this is, this is an enormous difference, okay? Now, let me point out that in the Bangladesh data, we also have um, scores on the Ravens test, which is supposed to be an aptitude test, but it, it, it's also a function of schooling. But nevertheless, when we look at male-female differences, they're, they're trivial, not statistically significant. So it's, it's not that. This is a real difference, okay. And the second, which is less well known, is that increases in nutrition increase brawn for men substantially more than for women. There's a big medical literature that shows this, and it's understood why this is true. And it has to do with the fact that testosterone is, plays a significant role in converting nutrients to brawn, and men have much amount, more amounts of testosterone than do women. And it's one of the reasons why um, people in sports will cheat sometimes by taking testosterone supplements, 
which will increase their brawn for given nutrition. Okay. So we want to embed these two biological facts into, into a model and see what their implications are when households are choosing optimally investments in nutrition and investments in schooling and optimally choosing occupations based on the comparative advantage. All right, so what, what's the model? So the Roy economy is there's a continuum of tasks and each worker is a bundle of attributes, skill and brawn, H and B. And the, the output from a worker is described by a production function. The production function for that worker, so we can think of a worker working in a task which produces an output and he gets paid for that output that's produced, which is what determines the, the worker's compensation. That's gonna be a function of his skill and his brawn, okay? You can see this is a Cobb-Douglas production function. What's different here is the parameters of the Cobb-Douglas Douglas production function, namely the alphas, differ by the activity I. So they're very different. So again, there are certainly activities that are skill intensive and activities that are brawn intensive. We can order the occupations by skills such that the, by alpha, sorry, by the returns to skill by, by alpha, such that the higher I tasks are ones that have higher alphas. Okay, so we can look at what, what determines the amount of, of I by, by that ordering. All right, but there are also other technologies that we have to incorporate in the model. These are the biological ones. So the first says that brawn is gonna be a function of body mass where the parameter gamma tells, tells us the translation of body mass into brawn. And what we're gonna assume is that gamma is positive for men, but just for simplicity, it's less for women. We're gonna make it zero for women just to highlight the differences. So that's where our key gender difference is going to come in. The second is how nutritional intake consumption affects body mass. And we assume that the, the, the greater is consumption, the greater is body mass. And the, um, the parameter theta is a parameter that characterizes the efficacy or the efficiency by which calories increase body mass. So we can think of this public health campaign, which cleaned up the water and reduced morbidity, made the efficiency of calorie intake greater. Because if you're sick, you're not able to, to retain the nutrition that, that you have as an intake. So if we want to make some policy statements from the model, we can manipulate, we can look at the comparative statics of variation in, uh, in theta. These equations have these endogenous inputs, consumption and, and body mass. They also have an, an exogenous component, which we'll call the endowment. So people may be born with different amounts of strength and they may be, may be born with different amounts of body mass as well. All right. Then we can look at the production of skill. Well, of course, schooling is a major determinant of, of skill, but also nutrition may play a role. And a key feature of this production function is potentially the complementarity between, so that's the cross derivative, of nutritional intake and schooling. And the deworming RCT was specifically designed to identify this cross partial that in fact, increasing nutrition by eliminating worms who are competing with the human body for, for, for nutrition would increase schooling, okay? By raising the return to schooling. And then finally, we have that the children earn income and income is a function of brawn. Okay, and income is higher for brawn. And we've made the assumption that the amount of schooling doesn't really affect the returns to what the, the activities that children engage in. Okay, so now we just add the, the economics. We're gonna assume that households are gonna choose schooling and calorie consumption and the activities for their children optimally, their welfare function, tells us that they care about the consumption of their children. And we'll have, we'll, in this case, take one child to make it simple. They care about the consumption of the child, um, the effective consumption that takes into account the, the degree of uh, efficacy of that. And they care about the child's adult wage, okay? And there's a budget constraint. Income is uh, from the children who earn a wage omega, which depends on whether or not they're in school and the expenditures are on 
nutrition and on unschooling, which has a direct price. So we look at the first order condition for men. Yeah, it tells us a number of things. We look at the last one. That's the first order necessary condition for optimal employment in occupations. And what it tells us is that decision depends on the ratio of skill to brawn. So it's comparative advantage. It's a standard result from Roy models. The first first order necessary condition describes the optimal choice for schooling. And what it says for men, where gamma is non-zero, so gamma appears in the equation, is that the, the shadow price of an additional unit of nutrition of consumption is not just the market price, but it's actually subsidized lower to the extent that that increase in nutrition increases the wage of the child, which then reduces the net cost of uh, adding that those additional nutrients. Okay, so so the the shadow price of nutrients depends on the fact that there's a return to brawn, okay? and the overall returns, of course, depend on that the, the parents get utility from that additional consumption, but there's also a return in terms of the wage, okay? And then the, so that's the equation, I'm sorry, that's not for schooling, but the equation that describes the, the nutrient allocation. For schooling, it's the, what we would expect that the return to schooling depends on alpha, which depends on the occupation that's chosen, which is of course endogenous. And then the opportunity costs are the, the uh, wage that children earn, and then there's a direct price. Now we contrast that, to the first order necessary conditions for women, okay, where, where gamma is zero, that is they get no additional brawn from nutrient intake. Okay? The first order conditions for schooling and for occupational choice look the same, okay? but for the allocation of calories, you don't get the, the, the subsidy effect. So it immediately tells us that uh, women are going to get less calorie allocations in these families then will men in an environment where brawn matters in the economy. And that's in fact what you see in, in, uh, in Bangladesh, that in all households, women get more calories than men. And while that could be discrimination and bargaining power in, the, in those households, this framework tells us that it's also due to the fact that the returns to calories are higher for boys than they are for girls. Okay. And it's associated with the fact that in that boys work in more calorie intensive activities. Okay, so for policy purposes, what we may want to know the effects on the schooling of men and women, boys and girls from reductions in morbidity. That's what we're after, which in this model would be changes in the, in the theta, which affects the efficacy of nutritional intake. And we might also wanna know what happens when there's an increase in the economy and the demand for skill. Well, it turns out with respect to the first, which is our focus here, that the comparative statics for variation in theta are exactly the same as comparative statics in the variation in the endowment of body mass. Okay. So the reason we're gonna do that is empirically, we're gonna be able to look at that variation while we don't have a policy variation that we can look at because in fact, the policy in Bangladesh applied everywhere. There's no variation in it. Okay. so. What do we get from the, the model in terms of comparative statics? So what we get is if brawn and body mass are positive, re, positively related, which is true for men, an increase in body mass through whatever intervention that occurs or whether it's an endowed body mass may actually decrease schooling for men and decrease the average skill intensity of the occupations of men. But for sure from lemma one, so that says may, okay? Lemma one says for sure, that if brawn and body mass are pos positively related for males or more strongly positive, positively related for males, then increases in body mass, increases in nutrition for everyone will decrease schooling for men relative to women and increase the gender division of labor. So it, it fits what we see occurred in Bangladesh. When there was an increase, when there was a decrease in morbidity and an increase in nutrition, little status is seen by the body mass indices and, and height, we also saw that there was a, a relatively stronger increase in schooling com of women compared to men. So it fits the descriptive statistics, but of course that's not a test of the model at all. All right, so we wanna test the model and we're gonna use data from Bangladesh 
which has three rounds of data. It's panel data. The first round was done in 1981-82, which is a probability sample of households that is meant to be representative of all rural households in Bangladesh. It was designed to, in fact, describe the nutritional status of individuals and households in Bangladesh at that time. There was a follow-up survey in 2002, which interviewed all of the original members of those households, as well as any individual members that were born after 1981 or 82, or any individuals that were brought into the households through marriage. Plus there was an additional refresher sample. So that's why the, the sample size is uh, more, than, more than doubles. And then there was a follow-up in 2007-8, where that increase in sample size is all due to uh, fertility, that new, new people were born, and also marriage. Okay, so now a unique feature of this data is that it has individual specific in food intake. Almost all surveys provide information on consumption at the household level, but this is does it at the individual level, okay, as well as anthropometric information and other, other features that I'll highlight later. Okay, so what are we gonna do? In the empirical work, what's done is to estimate the effects of the body mass endowment for males and females on schooling choice and occupational selection. Okay, obviously the challenge is where we're gonna get the, how we're gonna measure body mass endowments. And the second is even more challenging is it's going to estimate the wage function that's gonna incorporate both the body mass endowment, brawn, and heterogeneity and returns to skill and brawn across different occupations as in the Roy model. Okay. So the first step is to, obtain measures of the, the body mass endowments. And the way that's done is to, to use methodology that was used in an earlier article, which is to estimate a body mass production function. What's in that production function? Well, body mass is gonna be a function of the amount of calories and other nutrients that one consumes, as well as what activities you're engaged in. So when people are interested in maintaining their body weight, in developed countries, the two things that they hear about are you've got to uh, moderate the amount of, that you consume and you've got to engage in more activities that expend energy. So those are the, the two main inputs in, that determine body mass. And of course, the amount you, that, are, that is consumed and the activities are endogenous, as the model says. So this is the, the body mass production function is going to be estimated using instrumental variables. Uh, using village level prices and foods and uh, interacted with uh, household land holdings, which are exogenous in this economy. Okay. The residuals from that body mass production function are going to be a measure of the body mass endowment. So they're the, the body mass that someone has net of the endogenous inputs and activities of, of that person. And of course they're measured with error. But in this data set, there were for a subset of uh, the households, there were four different measures of the inputs and outputs. So that enables us with these multiple measures of the endowments to take into account the body, the uh, measurement error in body mass. So what's gonna happen is, this is the reduced form equation that relates the body mass endowment to a, a set of outcomes like schooling, okay? Where we allow for the fact that the observed body mass is going to be equal to the true body mass endowment plus an error term. Okay? And we can jointly estimate the measurement equation and the reduced form body mass equation using maximum likelihood because it's a subset of the households in a method that's called generalized linear and latent and mixed model estimation. Okay, But the, the, the key thing is we're taking into account the the measurement error, measurement error in the body mass index based on the residuals using these repeated measures. Okay. The table one describes the estimates from the body mass production function. The first column is the body mass production function parameters that were estimated in the earlier 1990 article from the first round of the Bangladesh survey. Now, if these are truly production function parameters that are structural, it should be true that when the body mass production function is re-estimated 20 years later from a population that has actually very little overlap, 
of adults, given the refresher sample and the new people brought into the thing, the parameter estimates should be the same. Okay? If we have any confidence that this is a production function, and in fact, we cannot reject the hypothesis that these estimates are different across the, the these different populations, but in the same um, in the same country. Okay, and they you know they indicate what we know, which is that increased calories, increased body mass, conditional on activities and activities that are that are characterized as being very active and energy intensive, reduce uh, body mass. Fine. So from this, we get the residuals for every individual. This is again estimated at the individual level where body mass is the dependent variable. Okay, so let's now take those residuals and see what they're related to. So the first test is whether in fact it's true that the higher body mass endowment men have greater strength than the higher body mass endowment women. The dependent variable here is kilograms of pressure using a dynamometer uh, that measures the degree to which they can, uh, measures grip strength uh, uh, directly, okay? The GLAM estimates take into account measurement error. You can see that, in fact, the uh, endowment effects are underestimated, biased to zero, as we'd expect with, with classic measurement error, okay? And the estimates are clear. The coefficient for men is more than four times the coefficient for women and is highly statistically significant. It tells us that a one standard deviation increase in the body mass endowment for men increases their grip strength by 6%, while a one standard deviation for women increases uh, the grip strength by less than 1%, okay? So we replicate what the, the literature has known for a long time in the biological literature, that body mass affects strength for men, and it doesn't really affect it for women. Okay. Now, what we care about here is schooling. All right. So we have the body mass endowments obtained for the children aged basically 1 to 15 in 1982. And in 2002, 20 years later, we're going to look at the relationship between those body mass indices that were estimated in 1982 on their schooling attainment. Okay. We do that for males and females. And what we see is, again, taking into account the measurement error, which again is biased to zero, okay, the higher body mass endowed men have less schooling, significantly less schooling, while the higher body mass women have marginally, but not statistically significant, increased schooling. The quantitative estimate says that for one standard deviation, in the body mass for men increase, decreases their schooling by half a year, which is about 12%. Okay? So increasing the body mass for men decreases schooling. Now, what's, what's going on? The model is telling us what's going on. The increased body mass associated with increased brawn for men increases the opportunity cost of schooling for, for boys, but does not increase the opportunity cost of schooling for, boy, for, for girls. In addition, it increases their return to being employed in body mass intensive occupations where body mass is rewarded and where schooling is concomitantly not rewarded. So they have less incentive to, uh, to increase their schooling. Fine. Now what's important is that the body mass endowment is rewarded in the labor market. So the first two columns of ta this table tell us the relationship again between the the body mass endowment measured when these uh, individuals were children on their subsequent wages. And what we can see again is that the higher body mass endowed males okay, have significantly higher wages. In fact, it says that a one standard deviation of uh, the, the body mass endowment increases wages by 7%. Okay. I'll, now, you'll notice that we don't have women here. And that's because very few women are working for wages. So we can't, at this point, look at the relationship between the endowments of women and, and, their, uh, and their, their earnings. But we'll come back to that in a, in a few minutes. Okay. Now, I also want to draw your attention to the fact that it's not just endowments that affect uh, the outcomes. Go back to the other thing. It's also the household's wealth and land holdings. Okay, so the, the household land holdings really matter. 
for achievement of, of schooling. So that, that's possibly an income effect. And they then also matter for directly conditional on schooling uh, on wages as well. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is that's going to contribute to an identification strategy for estimating the, the wage equation that takes into account the, the role of brawn and uh, skill. All right. We can also look in 2002 at, at children's attendance in school. There are three activities of children, in fact. They can be in school, they can be in the labor market, or they can be uh, at home. Okay. And so we use a multinomial logic to look at those activities as a function of endowments. This is using those estimates to look at the effects of endowments on the probability of the child age 10 to 15 being in school. And you can see for boys, it's significant and negative. And for girls, it's again, marginally positive. The quantitative estimate says that the of one standard deviation increase in the body mass of boys reduces the probability that they're in school by 6.6%. Okay, so we get, whether we look at boys, whether we look at um, attendance, whether we look at attainment, we get the same result that uh, bigger boys have lower schooling, bigger girls have, if anything, a marginally more schooling. Okay, now what about occupation? Okay. Well, what we can do is we can characterize occupations by their energy requirements because the FAO and the WHO publish the energy, literally the energy costs of activities. In, in particular, they provide the ratio of the average en energy requirement per unit of time divided by the, the basal meta metabolic rate, which is basically the energy expenditure when someone is not doing anything by activity. And you can see in, in the slide some examples. So pulling a rickshaw, which is a very important occupation in Bangladesh, uh, has a, a physical activity rate of 7.2, which is uh, five to six times higher than the physical activity rate associated with what we do in our lives, which is mostly filing. And well, we don't do much filing anymore, but we do a lot of reading and we do a lot of typing and, and writing. And that has among the lowest uh, physical activity rates uh, of, of any. And you can see that there's even bed making. So these are activities, any kind of activity. So it's not neglecting the activities that many women are engaged in in the economy who are not in the, the formal uh, labor market. So it, it has bed making, it has laundry, it has every kind of activity and its physical activity rate. So we're gonna use these as dependent variables. We're gonna ask, is there a relationship between the body mass endowment and, the act, and then the activities that the adult is engaged in? Okay, and so the, the dependent variable here is, is the occupational energy expenditure. And what we can see is that, again, taking into account measurement error, that men are much more likely to be in energy intensive occupations. They're going to be in brawn based activities. And bigger women are significantly less likely to be in that, those activities. Again, because if they have a, a better endowed men in terms of nutrition, that's going to be associated with greater schooling. And so they're going to shift to activities that, that are less energy uh, intensive. And of course, we still see a role for household land holdings. All right. So the final thing in this study is to actually estimate the wage function that's consistent with the Roy model structure. So this repeats the wage function, right? It was a function of skill and of brawn. And for each specific occupation, the parameters are different. So that's quite challenging, right? Because basically you need to know uh, if there are 100 occupations, we have to estimate 100 different values for alpha. Okay, so that's, that's pretty challenging. So one way to get around that is uh, to make some additional assumptions and play around with those. And in particular, what's assumed is that the, the coefficient for skill by occupation is gonna be a function of the, uh, is related to the energy expenditure epsilon of that activity, which we can measure, okay? We'll, we'll ignore the pi just for simplicity. So, so th that's the first assumption, functional form assumption. Secondly, we'll assume that skill is a function of, is an exponential function of schooling and, and age, and that brawn is an exponential function of the body mass endowment, okay? So when we incorporate those functional forms into the, the Cobb-Douglas wage equation and take logs, then we get 
parameters that are linear in logs. Okay, and we can actually identify uh, we can actually identify some of those parameters. But in particular, the model sorry predicts the following. The effect of schooling on log wages should be positive. That's new one. Remember, new one is the alpha and beta from the from the schooling production function. So as long as schooling increases skill, which we think it does, then that's going to be positive. That's obviously nothing novel. Okay. It also tells us that new sub two is negative. That's the interaction between the brawn intensity of the occupation and schooling. So what it says is that the effect of schooling on the wage is going to be lower to the extent that the person is, a, is in a brawn intensive activity. And that's because the alpha is, is lower by construction. And then finally, new four is positive. That tells us that the returns to brawn are higher in a uh, brawn intensive activity. So obviously schooling and uh, the, is endogenous. We have the measurement error in the endowments. That's going to be taken into account. Um, the a choice of occupation, that is the energy intensity of the occupation that we observe someone in, is also endogenous. Okay, so we're going to use as instruments the, the land holdings. The excluded instruments are going to be the land holdings of the household, the uh, education of the parents, and interactions of those, of those things. Okay. And here are the estimates. So what we find is that schooling is positively related to uh, wages, not a surprise, but that the interaction between schooling and the occupational energy expenditure is negative as predicted by the model. Okay. And the effect of the brawn endowment on male wages is, uh, is negative, okay, but becomes increasingly positive the extent to which the energy expenditure of the occupation is important. So if it's a brawn-based occupation, the returns to brawn are positive. Now, we can also do this for women. So if you look at the sample sizes, we've got 1,000 men earning wages, over 1,000 men, and we only got 79 women earning wages. Okay, so we need to take into account the selectivity, and that's, that's done uh, in the equation. So that's why there's a lambda coefficient. Okay, and now, in principle, these are structural parameters. These are describing the occupational structure in terms of the returns to brawn and the returns to skill by occupation. Those should be the same whether the person bringing the brawn and skill is a male or a female. That, that is to say, in this framework, there's no differences between men and women other than the brawn and skill they bring to an occupation. So therefore, the, the effects of schooling and, and brawn should be the same for men and women. Well, that would be the true if the occupational set for men and the occupational composition for women were the same. But unfortunately, the overlap of the two sets of occupations is, is actually quite small. So essentially, we're estimating what the occupational structure of occupations held by women is when we look at the women uh, data. And we are estimating what the occupational structure looks like for men in this economy. If we did this for a, a bigger economy, had more samples, a more advanced economy, then the uh, the, the common mass would be the would would be would be stronger, and and then the estimates should be the same. Qualitatively, they are the same. And interestingly, even though there's only seventy nine, you see they're estimated with 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 precision. Okay. So the wage, these, these estimates, what they imply is the effect of increased body mass on the wage is positive for activities engaged in by over two thirds of the activities engaged in by male workers and, po and schooling as a positive return for low energy activities, which are precisely the kinds of activities that, that women are, are engaged in. Okay. So it, it lines up with the basic framework. Okay. So, I want to turn to data from China. And because there are two issues that you might have with the study that I just described. The first is you might be suspicious about this res residual measure of health endowments, because it essentially relies on the functional form of the production function. And if the production function functional form is wrong, although there's robustness tests, in fact, in the, in the article for that, uh, then you know those 
those those estimates could be quite misleading. Okay. We're going to use data on twins, which are going to enable us to estimate endowment effects, which just rely on, on birth weight that don't require any functional form assumption. So we're going to have a direct measure of the endowment at birth. Okay. And the second thing is that we're going to be able to, with the Chinese data that I'll describe, look at what happens over, over time. Let me first talk about this issue about, about birth weight. So it's going to be data on, on twins both adult twins and child twins. Okay. And both of those data sets provide information on the birth weights of the, of the children and of the, of the adults. Now, the birth weight of a child obviously is endogenous. It's gonna depend on prenatal investments by the, the mother and maybe the father. Uh, so it reflects the nutritional intake of the fetus in the womb, which is clearly endogenous. Okay. It also reflects some genetic endowments that people, as we've talked about, could be bigger or smaller based on their genetic endowments as well. Okay. What we want is to eliminate the, the genetic component and isolate the nutritional component and also deal with the fact that birth weight is endogenous. And we can do that by looking at the birth weight differences across monozygotic, that is genetically identical twins. Okay. So the differences in birth weight between MZ, monozygotic twins, is completely random. It has nothing to do with the preferences of the parents for birth weight. It has nothing to do with whether the parents are rich or poor. It's purely based on the position of one or the other in, in, the, in the womb, okay? So it's both the differences are random and the differences, as I'll show you, are not small. So this is the distribution of the value of birth weight among identical twins at birth, okay? It's about, the median is about 11 ounces. Okay? So there's a lot of variation that one could play with, okay? So, so that's going to be what we're gonna use as our endowment measure. And, um, okay, so that's gonna be one method. Okay. The other thing we can do with these data is to look at the change in occupational structure over time in terms of the relative intensity of the occupations with respect to brawn. So these are the occupational categories in the, in the data. Okay. Unfortunately, it's not very detailed. But I think it's safe to say that occupational categories six and seven are occupations in which brawn is much more important than the rest of the occupations. So what we can do is we can characterize the occupation of the individuals in these data sets by their brawn intensity, by taking note of what occupation they're in. Okay. Now, what we'd like to see, so I'd like to track is the, the change in the occupational structure over time. And a unique feature of the adult uh, twins data and the non-twins data, which are the, basically the, a clone of those data, is that it asks what the occupation was of each of the persons in that data set when they, when they married. Now, most people married, both men and women, at between the ages of 20 and 29. So essentially, we're looking at the occupational um, composition of people aged 20 to 29 for different cohorts of people, and we can track that. So this graph shows the proportion of employment in occupations that are skill intensive, non-brawn intensive. Okay. And what you can see in China from 67 to 82 is that there was a decline in the skill intensity of occupation, an actual decline, right? So this is the error of Mao policies. And in 1982, there was a complete shift in policies to policies associated with the Dong reforms that opened up the Chinese economy. Okay? And whatever the relationship is between that policy and the, the transformation, the transformation of the occupational structure is very clear. There was an increase, monotonic increase in the fraction of occupations that were, were skill intensive. More interestingly, if we look at this by male and female, what you see is 
that it was a much greater increase in the skill intensity of the occupations of women compared to men, okay? which is consistent with the idea that as the economy moves from being brawn intensive to skill intensive, it favors women. And you may recall from, yesterday, from the earlier in the lecture that where we saw that the rate of return to schooling for women was higher than that of men and was increasing relative to men, that tracks precisely what we see in the data with respect to occupation. So this is consistent with the idea that women are, are entering into skill intensive occupations at a greater rate than our men, right? And therefore, when we look at the productivity of their schooling, it's going to be greater in those occupations as in the Roy model than it is for the occupations engaged in by men. So this both tracks what we see with regard to the Mincer rates of return estimates and also is consistent with the more structural Roy model of the economy. All right, so let's return to this issue about the endowment effects. Okay. So we're gonna look at differences across child twins and adult twins on a set of outcomes like schooling and wages. Okay. And we're gonna allow the coefficients on those to differ by, by gender. Okay, so looking at the adult twins and schooling attainment, okay, what we see is when we look at differences in birth weight across female monozygotic twins and across male monozygotic twins, there's a strong relationship between birth weight and schooling attainment for females and negative, but not statistically significant effect of birth weight for males. So that replicates what we see in Bangladesh, except now we get a much more positive effect for females from the body mass endowment. And while we still get a negative effect for males, it's not well uh, estimated. We also see that birth weight has a significant effect on the monthly wage for males, but has very little effect directly on the monthly wage for women in general. Okay. We can also look at the child twins at performance in school. Okay, so let's pay attention to, let's ignore the rural urban, it's not important for us uh, today, okay? So this is the effect of birth weight differences, monozygotic twins on performance on math and language tests. And what we can see is that it's a stronger effect for females on performance in school than males. And that difference is statistically significant. When we look at student honors for that child, we see that it, uh, it's stronger for females than it is for males. And that difference is statistically significant. When we look at who are purely just biological effects, on weight for height, there's no difference. For both males and females, the effect of having a, a more nutrition in the womb shows up in, in later life as a as larger BMI, essentially. And that difference is not statistically significant. We can look at also the parents' expectations of completed years of schooling. And again, we see the same thing. The larger birth weight girls are more likely to be uh, to complete more years of schooling compared to the higher of birth weight males. And that difference is statistically significant. The expectation of attending college, stronger effect for female birth weight than male birth weight. On health, however, again, no difference in birth weight. So these, these replicate what we see in, in Bangladesh. Okay, so it, it looks like we can have some explanation for the higher level of schooling and the higher rates of return to schooling for women compared to men is a natural effect of the comparative advantage of men and women in the economy. And those differences in schooling are, however, gonna depend on the structure of the economy, to, to, to what extent occupations are skill intensive versus brawn intensive. And what you can see as a first step is that in economies in which agriculture is the predominant occupation, that's an occupation where ignoring the, the technology uh, change part is mostly rewarding brawn. And that's therefore an economy in which men are going to be better off because they have a comparative advantage in that attribute that's rewarded more in that economy. As the economy shifts to being more school intensive, that's gonna favor women. That's what that implies. Okay, so the next topic is family size and human capital investment. 
the people have noticed, and we can see that in our data descriptively, you may recall from yesterday's lecture, we looked at the fraction of 15 to 19 year olds who completed nine years of schooling. This is, and we looked at fertility, total fertility rates for women. This is the correlation between the two. It's strongly negative. And the, in fact, the correlation is 0.7, minus 0.7, right? And that correlation in general, you can see in the cross section within any country as well. And it led people to think that, okay, so family size might be a barrier to, uh, to fertility. And then, oh, to, sorry, to schooling investment. And in fact, there's a, a well-known model in economics that tells us why that, that could be true, which is the quality quantity model. And the quality quantity model says that parents care about the number of children and they care about the average quality per child. Okay? But to increase the average quality per child, you've got to expend more for each child. So the total cost of increasing quality is gonna depend on the number of children you have. So if you want to send one child to school, to, to college and pay tuition, or you want to send two ch children to college, then it's going to cost twice as much for a household that has two children. Okay. And so the, the basic idea that they had in constructing this model is that the marginal rate of substitution between number of children and the average quality of a child was, not, was gonna depend not just on the prices of increasing quality and the, the, the cost of increasing the number of children, but it was gonna depend on the levels as well because of that interaction, okay? All right, so then there is a reason to think that uh, there's a direct relationship between the number of children and the quality investment in, in children. And one idea is that one could use the phenomenon of twinning to look at the effect of an extra child that's exogenous on schooling investment. Okay? And in this article, it was, it was shown how exactly to interpret the effect of N on Q in terms of the, the quality quantity model, which basically says that the, the effect of N on Q is the ratio of the compensated cross price effect over the own price effect, whether you're looking at uh, Q or N there. Okay. So as long as the, the compensated price effect is negative, which every consumption model predicts, and as long as the cross price effect is, is positive, that they're substitutes, then you're going to get that uh, an increase in N will indeed decrease the, the quality per child. Okay? And, and twins was a way of, of doing this. And so in that original article, uh, they found support that in households in India that had twins, uh, schooling attainment was lower. There was a subsequent literature, which again tested the quality quantity model using twins from a, a number of different countries. Okay. And some of those studies found no support for the fact that when the household had twins, which upped their family size, there would be lower schooling. Okay. So it's important for us to look at what they did to understand why they get this null result. Okay, so this is the basic econometric model that they employed. Okay. So they looked at the outcome. Let's assume, just for simplicity, that all women have two pregnancies. Okay? And that on the second pregnancy, they may have twins. Okay? So the methodology that's applied, they do it for, for higher parities as well, but it becomes increasingly selective in, in, the, in these countries. So if we stick to women having two pregnancies, um, then we're gonna characterize most of the women. So the way they did this was they looked at the, the a quality measure, let's, let's say schooling, which is what they looked at for the, in the most case, as a function of the number of children in the, the family, okay, that were born subsequent to that first child, okay? And they instrumented the number of children born subsequent to the birth of the first child with whether or not there was a twin. So if we have the, the two pregnancy case, it's, a, it's whether or not the family had a twin on the second pregnancy compared to women who had a singleton birth, right? So that's the instrument. Obviously should be a pretty good instrument for predicting the number of children that the the family has, okay? And beta then is the effect of instrumented N on Q, okay? They had a vector of control variables 
And this is the, now for this to be this instrumental variable method to be valid, it needs to satisfy the exclusion restriction. Okay, it needs to satisfy, in particular, that the incidence of twinning is uncorrelated with the unobservables in the schooling outcome equation. So then the question is, what is in the un the unobservable components of that equation, and what we can assume is what is included are the unobserved endowments of the children. Okay? So we can take into account, we'll ignore Braun for the moment, we can take into account that children have different aptitudes, different abilities, okay? and that those different abilities will affect the resource allocations that the family makes to those children. And every model of family resource allocations will say that the allocation to a child I in a multi-child family is gonna depend not just on that child's own endowment, but it's gonna depend on the child, the other children's endowment as well. It's an allocation of resources across children with different endowments. So in these equations, those endowments are missing. Children are heterogeneous. Okay, fine. Why should that lead to bias in the, the twinning methodology? Well. The reason is that twins have lower endowments than singletons. In, for example, one simple measure of that is that the birth weight of twins is significantly lower than the birth weight of singletons. And there's now a large literature that shows that birth weight, as we saw, matters for outcomes, particularly for, for women. but but also for, for men as well at a lesser, to a lesser degree in developed countries, okay? So, and the difference is substantial. On average, the birth weight of twins is 30% lower than it is for singletons. And again, we can look at the distribution in the US between of birth weight between singleton twins and um, singletons and twins. And we can do this for Kunming, China, which is a relatively poor area of China, and you can see that those differences are, are exhibited in the US as well as in China. Again, it's, it's biological. It's the, the two children are competing for limited resources within the womb. In a sense, it's a quality quantity model within the womb. If there's more children sharing a fixed amount of resources, then there's going to be less, uh, less quality, okay? So twinning does two things. It not only increases family size, it, it lowers the average endowments of children because the, the endowments of the twins are lower, but it also, this is important, alters the relative endowments of the children. And it alters them in a way such that it favors the first child. So when there are twins on the second pregnancy, the endowments of those children are lower than the singleton birth that's the, first, that's the outcome of the first pregnancy. This will lead parents to allocate resources differentially across twins and the first children. How will they do that? Well, then it's crucially going to depend on what is the effect of, on the resource allocation. So we can think of two things. If the twins have lower endowments compared to the first birth child, parents may choose to compensate. They may choose to allocate more resources to the, to the twins in order to equalize the outcomes, or they may reinforce those differences, taking into account that if the first birth, first birth singletons are higher ability, they'll get a higher return from schooling investments compared to the twins. Okay? So what does that tell us? Well, we could construct a simple model. I don't have time to, to, to go over it which is just going to tell us the following, that the estimate of the second birth twins effect, which is what's done in this methodology, on the first born schooling will be too negative, will be, sorry, too positive to the extent that parents reallocate resources to the first child away from twins because of the reinforcement effect. And it'll be the opposite. It'll be too negative if they do the, the opposite. Now, if we have a general model, we don't know what parents will do. So we have to first understand how they allocate resources by the endowment of children. 
And we can use birth weight to do that using the twin survey that we've talked about before. Okay, so we'll get to that. But so the reason that this study was done in China was that we could exploit the, the one child policy. So these were rural and urban households. And in the urban households, which are not, which are not exempted from the one child policy, what we see is that the, there's com almost complete compliance. That is to say, households that had twins in urban areas had two children and no more children than two. And households that didn't have chin children, oh, sorry, twins, 95% of them had only one. So there's almost perfect compliance, which means that the latent average treatment, sorry, the local average treatment effect is going to be basically the population effect, that there's, there's no selection into who's a complier and who's a non-complier. Everybody complied, okay? If you didn't get an assignment of twins, you had one. If you got an assignment of twins, you had, you had two. All right, so we're gonna compare the effects of twinning on the first birth, on the schooling, and twinning on the second birth on the schooling and other outcomes of firstborn children and secondborn children. Okay, so, and what I'm first gonna show you is that using the birth weight differentials of monozygotic twins, you find that in fact, the parental schooling expenditures per child were higher for the higher birth weight twins. So there's definitely reinforcement, not compensation, which means that we should expect to see that when we look at twinning on the second birth, on the outcome for the first birth, it will be too positive. All right, so we're gonna look at that, okay? So first, let me show you what happens to first birth twins. So these are the effects of first birth twinning on educational outcomes and for the urban sample where they can only have one pregnancy. Okay, and we saw they're all compliers. And what you see is that expected college enrollment is lower for, for first birth twins compared to singleton twins by a lot, okay? And that, that estimate is biased negatively because we don't take into account that the twins have lower birth weight. So when we include birth weight in the equation, we see that indeed does reduce an absolute value of the negative effect. It shows up for years of completed schooling. It shows up for math grades. It shows up for literature grades as well. And again, when we control for birth weight, it, it, tends, it, it does what is expected. It makes the negative effect less negative. Okay. When we look at second birth twinning for the rural sample where they're permitted to have two pregnancies. So we look at all households that have two pregnancies, okay, which is 60% of the, of the households in the, in the data set. Okay. Again, expected college enrollment, years of completed schooling as our outcome measures. Okay. Second birth twins, we're looking at twins on the second birth here, not the first birth. Okay. So if they have second birth twins, then those twins have lower expected college enrollment. Okay. When we look at the effect of having second birth twins on first birth twins, I'm sorry, first birth singletons, okay, we, we use the interaction. And the interaction tells us that the effect of twinning on the second pregnancy on the singletons is less negative. Okay, that's the difference because it's the interaction term. The sum of those two things, which is the total effect of twinning on the second pregnancy on first birth singletons is, is negative, right? If we sum those two things, it's, it's clearly negative and statistically significant. But it does tell us that the estimate is too positive for the, for the singletons uh, in terms of what the quality quantity model predicts, which is that an increase in family size lowers the average schooling of the, of the children. By looking at only the first birth children who are not twins, we get an estimate that's much higher than the average effect because of the reallocation of resources to that first child. Okay? Now, when we control for, for birth weight, we shrink that differential, but it's still there. And it may be still there simply because the, the singleton birth is, is a singleton until the twins are born. In fact, the effect of, of N on resources to that firstborn child is zero for the first few years of life. If the twins are born five years after the singleton birth, then that child enjoys 
five years of being an only child. Okay, so it's always going to be the case that the first child is going to have more resources than subsequent children be because they are competing with that, with that first child. And if they're twins, they're also competing with the twins. But nevertheless, it's in, that bias is enhanced by the fact that the endowments of twins are lower as well. So that's what we see. Now, what about these estimates? What do they tell us about the one-child policy? Okay. Well, we can get an upper bound estimate of the one-child policy. We can, we can use the maximum quality quantity trade-off that is obtained from the twins estimates that you just looked at. And we can multiply that by the maximum effect that people have found that the one-child policy had in reducing fertility. There isn't a lot of studies of that. There are two of them. They, they, they're within the bounds of each other. So one of them says that the, that the one-child policy led to a reduction of the number of children by 0.25. The other said 0.33. Let's take the bigger estimate. Okay. So we're going to take the 0.33, take the maximum quality quantity trade-off that we see from our data, and, and compute the upper bound. Right. So the maximum quality quantity trade-off we saw for schooling progress, years of schooling, was minus 13%. An extra child decreased schooling progress by 13%. Okay. Well, then we multiply that by the, the, the 0.33 reduction in N, and we get that years of schooling was reduced by 4% by the one-child policy. Ex the expected proportion attending college was reduced, was increased by, was increased by 9%. Math grades and literature grades only trivially and, and some effect on, on good or excellent health, okay? So the bottom line is the one-child policy did not have a major impact by itself on, on schooling. Yet, of course, schooling increased enormously in China uh, post-1982. And again, we saw that there's a reason for that, that, that schooling became more productive in the economy as occupations shift from being brawn intensive to skill intensive. Okay. All right, the last thing I wanna look at briefly is the, an intervention that attempted to reduce the opportunity cost of, um, of children in school. So the basic design was that there would be conditional cash transfers provided to poor households where the condition was that the children had to enroll or, and attend school. Okay. So they identified poor communities and they identified within those poor communities, households that were poor. It turns out that household, that was 67% of households. And that this progressive program randomly phased in the program so that it could be evaluated. They, they basically chose 314 of the 495 poor villages to receive the program for the first two years. So they had a control group, which had exactly the same characteristics as the treatment group, right? And they can compare treatment to control. And these, now, what were the magnitudes? Well, what they did was they provided transfers to that are conditional on enrollment rate that were recognize differences in age because they were trying to compensate for opportunity cost and presumably the opportunity cost, um, the, the contribution of school of children to, um, in, to income was related to age. And they also differentiated by sex. And what's interesting here is they actually made the, uh, the, the compensation, the transfer higher for females than male children, okay? which is ironic given what we've seen, which is in fact, the opportunity cost of male children is significantly higher than it is for, for female children because the male children have more brawn than female children. Now, nevertheless, this is what they, they did. And also in Mexico at the time and now today, as we saw from the data yesterday, there are more women have higher schooling attainment than, than men. Okay, so this is the, the basic result. Prior to the program, the treatment and control village attainment years of, of a fraction in school, save for those who had already had six years of schooling was no different. Okay, so these are the differences for males and, and females. The number in parentheses is the probability of significance. Okay, then after the program was in place, there were differentials. Okay, and you can do the difference of the difference or just the just do the, the cross-sectional treatment versus control, you get the same answer. 
So there's no question that almost for every level of schooling that the program did increase school attendance by both males and, and females. Okay? If you sum then over the incremental school attendance across all of the years, as is done here, okay, you get that the expected total years of schooling would have increased by 0.66 years. Okay, so the total effect on the, the schooling from this intervention was to increase schooling by 10%. So it was a 50% reduction in opportunity cost, given what we know about the, the, the contributions of children to, to income, led to a 10% increase in schooling attainment. Okay. If there was a 10% return on schooling, then that would lead to a 7% increase in earnings. Now, if we look at per capita GDP in Mexico compared to the United States, that 7% increase in earnings associated with this increment in schooling is not, gonna, is not going very far to changing the gap in earnings between Mexico and the United States. And the president of Mexico at the time, who's now a an economist, a professor of economics at Yale, Ernesto Zadillo, characterizes this program, which was in, implemented under his regime with great expectations as a total failure, because he expected that this program was going to lead to a devel the development of the Mexican economy. And it clearly didn't. Okay. It did increase schooling. And just like the deworming increased uh, school attendance, these interventions don't seem to have a major impact in terms of development, even though they have a positive rate of return, sometimes a higher a high rate of return, because without a change in the skill price of schooling or the productivity of schooling associated with structural change in the economy, increments to schooling are not going to have a big impact on economic development. So let me stop there. And it's time to, for me to answer questions. Okay, thank you everyone for submitting your questions. I'm gonna take a small selection of the top voted ones. And if we have time, we'll take a few more. So the first question is from Mahir. They ask, how do we account for cognitive ability as a variable that affects returns from schooling? Mani et al 2013 shows how poverty impedes cognitive ability. Can these findings be extrapolated to children from low income households? Okay, the second question is from Ayala and they ask, Studies of the gender gap in agricultural productivity often control for labor inputs, but don't account for these systematic differences in labor quality between men and women. Does this difference in labor quality essentially imply that we won't expect equal agricultural productivities across men and women, and that a gap in productivity isn't a problem? And the final question uh, is quite a long one from Anaya. Anaya. In many developing countries, opportunity costs to schooling come from different underlying markets for boys and girls. That is, for boys, the opportunity cost of being in school comes from foregone earnings of the labor market. But for girls, the opportunity cost of being in school comes from the foregone time effort on domestic and caring duties. So is it realistic to assume the opportunity costs underlying being in school for males and females is the same as the models presented today do? Would there be different implications of the models you present if this was accounted for? And can you rule out an alternative explanation that lower educational attainment for men versus women is an artifact of legal structures that allow labor at a relatively low, lower age 15 than marriage and childbearing at 18? All right, that's a lot of questions in one question. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. So let me answer the last one first because in fact, the last one seems to have missed the major point of what I was talking about which is in fact, the opportunity costs of boys and girls are completely different, uh, in fact. And in fact, in that article, you'll see that it shows that the activities, just as the questioner suggested, the alternative activities for girls relative to school was, is home production. And for boys, it's market work, okay? Now, home production, we have data on the activities of home production. They're equally brawn intensive. That the, as the labor market production is, and it's the broad intensity of the activity that matters, not how we label it. It doesn't matter whether it's a market contribution in the labor market formally or a household contribution, both are valued in this model. 
What matters is the returns to the attributes that women, that the girls and boys have. And the fact is that the opportunity cost for boys of schooling is higher because they have more brawn than girls. And that's true both for household activities and for the, for the market activities. So the model stresses that the opportunity costs of girls and boys are very different. And that's one of the reasons that we see the differences in, uh, in, in schooling, okay? We didn't pay attention to, to legal structures here, but we paid attention to fundamental biological characteristics that are same for men and women, no matter what legal structures exist. And what you saw from the first lecture is in almost all economies, the females have more schooling than, than males. Okay, and comparative advantage suggests that we're going to see more women in skill intensive activities than we see men. And we also see that in almost all data sets in, in the world. So while legal structures can have an impact for sure on these, um, these attributes that we're, we're focusing on, they, are, they pale in comparison to these fundamental features that differentiate uh, by gender the people in the, in the economy. So this is not to neglect that, that policies and rules and laws don't have an impact on what we see, but to, to go with deeper than that, to look at the more fundamental reasons. So we had this, this great question yesterday of, you know, why do we see that in Pakistan and India, there's an exception to what we see almost elsewhere, everywhere which is that women have less schooling than, than men. And there we might look at whether it's some rules or regulations or a difference in the structure of the economy to, uh, to understand what's, what's going on. Okay, so the first question was about the role of cognitive ability. You'll, you'll note that cognitive ability is an outcome in, in these models. Cognitive ability is unfortunately in terms of uh, estimating its exogenous effect a function of schooling and schooling is an endogenous variable in the economy. So all of the estimates that I showed you uh, take into account that there are differences in cognitive ability as well. In other words, the, the body mass endowment, which reflects greater nutrition, leads to both increases in brawn for men, but not for women, but increases cognitive ability for both men and women equally which is why I didn't emphasize it because I was emphasizing the differences between men and women from those nutritional intakes. But cognitive ability plays a, a, a major role in everything that we saw. The reason that women with higher birth weight have higher schooling is precisely because it increases their cognitive ability. So it's, it's present in everything that we, that we looked at and is extremely important as other studies. The problem is that studies from developed countries only pay attention to cognitive ability and in fact, neglect the fact that there are differences in brawn across people, and that equally affects the, the earnings outcomes. And therefore, even the studies that take into account heterogeneity and cognitive ability are biased because they're neglecting heterogeneity and brawn. And then, of course, that bias is even greater in low-income countries where brawn has a much bigger payoff because of the occupational structure than it does in, uh, in high-income countries. And in fact, the bias is, is obvious. What we see is that individuals with greater brawn have lower schooling, optimally, and they're in activities that, of course, have uh, higher rewards for brawn. Given that there's a negative relationship between brawn and schooling, when we were, and brawn has a positive effect on wages, when we ignore brawn in our specification of, in an equation which has schooling on the right-hand side, that's going to bias downward the coefficient for schooling for men relative to women because brawn doesn't affect the wages of women as much as it does for men. So we have, we emphasize in most of the literature on earnings functions ability bias, but there's equally brawn bias. And the, the difference between the ability bias and the brawn bias is the brawn bias is stronger for women than, sorry, stronger for men than it is for women. It actually affects are inferences about the returns to schooling for men and women differently. All right. The second question was about production functions that ignore gender, that ignore the composition of the labor force. Yes, that's a big problem. What, what, the, what the data clearly show, we saw it for harvest workers 
And we saw that brawn matters in the Bangladesh data. They clearly show that if it's a brawn intensive occupation like weeding and harvesting, then given that women have less brawn than men, it's going to matter what the composition is in terms of, of gender. In fact, what we observe in, uh, in agriculture in most societies is that the wages that women earn in the same activity, let's say harvest, are lower than the wages men earn. Some of that may be to discrimination, but if we look at piece rates where there can't be any discrimination, people are paid precisely based on how much they've harvested, we see that the time wages gap and the piece rate wages gap based purely on productivity are not that very, not very different from each other. So yes, an, an implication uh, of this study is, is one, we can't just pay attention to heterogeneity in, in cognitive skill. We need to pay attention to heterogeneity in brawn. And the differences in brawn between men and women play a large role in understanding the differences in the earnings that they command, which will be a function of the degree of development of the economy. I think at least I attempted to answer all three questions. I think it may be over time, so we won't be able to take any more. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So that concludes our lecture for today. Next week we have we have uh, lectures on schools, starting with Esther Duflo.